තවත් තිකු කලක් රැඳෙන්න ඩබල් perfume look සමගින් මෙම නව sunlight rose Tonight, reverse decision. As the president attributes the fuel price hike to rising global prices, the opposition calls for it to be done away with. Record numbers. Sri Lanka sees the highest single-day vaccinations carried out across its high-risk areas. Foiled again. The Navy thwarts a massive drug operation seizing 219 kilograms of heroin. New status quo. China responds to the G7 saying that the days of minority global dictates are over. All that and much more coming up on First at Nine. This Sunday, the 13th of June, 2021. Signal Deep Clean Ekakatamarwin. From Ada Verana, this is Ada Verana First at Nine. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine, I'm Dham Kekanai. Now, opposition leader Sajid Premadasa has called on the government to scrap the new fuel price revisions, calling it a national disgrace. This is despite the presidential secretariat having issued an explanation for the decision, citing crude prices surpassing the 70 US, US dollar level, adding that going by market movements, it could end up even rising higher. This was evident by how prices have risen significantly in the past week by $3.19 since the 1st of June. The fuel price hike announced at midnight on Friday came as a big surprise to the average Sri Lankan on the streets. The sudden increase has now added extra pressure on a populace that is right now fatigued not only by a long drawn out pandemic induced travel restriction, but by the ill effects of a resultant economic slowdown on their personal incomes as well. However, was this really unexpected? Or was the writing on the wall already there, but we just didn't notice? A look at the light crude and brand crude prices for the past three months alone would show you how long it's been staring us in the face. On the 12th of March 2021, a barrel of light crude was priced at $65.61, and by the 23rd of March, it fell to its lowest point of $57.76. However, since then it has been a steady uphill journey to where it stood on Friday at $70.91. This is an increase of $3.19 since the 1st of June. Having followed the same pattern, Brent crude on Friday stood at $72.69 per barrel, an increase of $2.44. Hence, in a way, what we can gather is that maybe the issue here isn't the actual hike, but rather just bad timing. With that, the Presidential Secretariat today issued a communique explaining the reasons for the decision taken by the Cost of Living Committee. The statement cited the rise in crude prices in the recent months passing the 70 US dollar a barrel mark and added that according to market conditions, it will most likely continue to increase on high global demand. The Ceylon Petroleum Corporation meanwhile remains stuck in the middle, bearing a massive 333 billion rupees in accumulated losses. Minister of Energy Udaya Gamanpilla, under whose purview the CPC falls, has come under pressure for the price hike but said that there can be no blame on a single individual for a collective committee decision that was signed off by the finance ministry. He added that there are other factors that have contributed to CPC debts as well. Meanwhile, opposition leader Sajid Premadasa took to social media to demand that the government reverse its fuel price hike decision. The opposition labelled the move a shameful act by a government that is a national disgrace 
and promised to usher in an era of prosperity and development under a Samagi Janabalavega government. Now then, Sri Lanka's vaccine rollout for the general public is in effect in all but five districts in the island. What's more, it's gathering momentum with the island seeing its highest single-day vaccinations in the excess of 130,000 yesterday. Meanwhile, people are also encouraged to get the second dose of the vaccine against the virus to ensure a proper immune reaction. Sri Lanka's vaccination drive has been gathering momentum in the recent days, boosted by the 2 million doses of the China-manufactured Sinopharm jab purchased by the State Pharmaceuticals Corporation. What's more, 60,000 doses of Russia's Sputnik vaccine also reached the island last week. With that being the case, the vaccine rollout was further extended to members of the general public in the country last week. It is now worked off in all the districts except for Kandy, Mulativ, Kelenochi, Vaunia and Mana. The health authorities also began administering the second dose of the Sinopharm jab from the 8th of June. The vaccine drive kicked into high gear yesterday with 136,677 persons being given one of the two doses. 59,881 first doses of the Sinopharm vaccine were administered while 76,615 people were given their second dose. The AstraZeneca vaccine too was given to 181 persons yesterday. Meanwhile today, the second dose of the Sputnik vaccine was rolled out to residents in the areas of Angoda and Gothatur. Janatawa, Apadeka, Tamanta, Himidineta, Pere, Villa, Sinopam, Devuni and Natala Bagana, Porakana, Ekatuene, Ekarashi, and Sabahavia. Kisisetma, Ekatut, Karanepa, Mokade, Danata, Palavini Matra, Valabadi, Latina, Silu Denatama, Devuni Matra, Valabadin, Taram, Pramana, Sinopam, Minat Pramana, Capera Tetino, Ekanisan, you are in Mubagi in Natalabina, Tamanta, Danundi, Malabena Kang. In Nepa, in that Karnamadestan, it a Kalabala in Nepa, Anisi Vidhete, Balapam Karan Nepa, Mukade, May Vadapilula, Apita, Kraman Kuluva, Geniana, Pasutava, Tino. Etekamaki and Nona, Devani Matra, Sinopam, Labagat, Hamakene, Kanuarem, Labagat, Utumai. Mukade, Sinopam, Devani Matra, Labagina, Sati Dekakata Paman, Pasua Tamai, and gave Pratishaktia Gurnagene, Covid nineteen, Rogate Rehu. Ulu Palavini Matra, Vitra Karagene, Katarla, the Mutema, Ekarita, and Natalabagat, Namagi, Kishimate Ruman Kanti Veda. In the meantime, the epidemiology unit placed yesterday's daily COVID-19 caseload in the island at 2,354. Excluding 14 imported cases, the remaining 2,310 infections were confirmed across all 25 districts. The western province accounted for the highest number of the new cases yesterday, with the districts of Gampa and Colombo reporting 561 and 521 infections respectively. With those two districts included, the Western Province confirmed the most number of fresh cases yesterday, with 1,402. However, there is a considerable gap in the new daily infections to the next highest on the list, the Northern Province which recorded 210 cases. Within the province, 111 cases were confirmed in Jaffna. At the other end of the spectrum, the North Central Province reported the least number of fresh cases, confirming just 27. On the COVID fatalities front, there were 63 deaths confirmed yesterday, taking the country's overall tally to 2,136. 52 of the victims had been over the age of 60. The Department of Government Information reported that 47 of the victims had perished while receiving treatment at hospitals. In the meantime, Sri Lanka's COVID recoveries also jumped by 2,031 today, taking the tally to 188,554 with 1,886 new infections being confirmed so far during the day, the island's number of active cases currently stand at 32,480. The consequences of quarantine law violations have been made evident ever since the pandemic first hit Sri Lankan shores last year. The people are told repeatedly that the police are continuing with their crackdowns. And yet the island saw its highest single-day arrests within the last cycle exceeding 1,350. With island-wide travel restrictions in place, the police continue to monitor and ensure that the general public adhere to the quarantine rules and regulations. Although the public crackdown on travel restrictions and quarantine law violations is well documented, the police continue to record arrest. 1,353 such arrests had been made within the last 24-hour cycle, the highest since the quarantine laws first went into effect amid the pandemic 
on the 18th of March last year. Mitamatarava Basnagar Palatin Pitavanasa Hatulun Stana Dahatrakadi Visheshame Huma Sudukarati Bino Adadine Sad Priya Sambashana Pavatrima Sambandin Visheshame Hum Sudukrimata Polistana di Paturun Danwat Kartibino Obata Tiam Torotrak Tibinona Mahajan Ekatu in Pilibando Langamati Polistani Vito Ekaikai Name Durakatanan Kivit Danum Dinlesa Karuniko Ilasitno. Meanwhile, measures have been taken to ensure that inmates of prisons can connect with their family members via Zoom. State Minister of Prison Management and Rehabilitation Lohan Radwatta said that once a prison inmate's name and number are entered to the prison website, a date and a token number will be issued. As such, the relatives will be given the opportunity to speak with the inmate at a specified time. The Navy has busted over 200 kilograms of heroin, foiling an attempt to smuggle the haul into the country. Eleven suspects had also been arrested in the process. The police believe the drugs haul belongs to an international drug racketeer. The State Intelligence Service had been tipped off about an attempt to smuggle heroin into the country in the seas of Pollatumodara in Valigama. As such, the Sri Lanka Navy had given chase to a suspicious multi-day trawler. The Navy said that they had launched a raid once the dinghy reached ashore. The Police Narcotic Bureau and the Coast Guards too had contributed to the raid, during which 219 kilograms of heroin had been seized by the Navy. The Navy says that the drugs haul had been loaded onto the dinghy in international waters from a multi-day trawler. The vessel in question had set off to sea from the Cote Goda Fisheries Harbour on the 11th of May. Eleven persons had been arrested while the trawler and the dinghy had also been seized. The police suspect that the drugs all belongs to an international drug racketeer known as Harakata. In the meantime, the daughter of Karupaya Balan, alias Telbala, had been arrested by the police special task force last night from the area of Grand Pass. Balan is alleged to be an organized criminal. The police media spokesperson said that the suspect, 43-year-old Karupaya Nirmala, had 50 grams of heroin in her possession. The suspect had been handed over to the Colombo Anti-Vice Unit for further investigations. Three aircraft of the Sri Lanka Air Force returned to the island after being put through an upgrade in the Ukraine. The planes are expected to increase the transport capabilities of the Air Force by 75%. Air Force Commander Air Marshal Sudarshana Patirana said that the trio of aircraft will be used for surveillance and reconnaissance purposes. Three Antonov 32 aircraft belonging to the Heavy Transport Squadron of the Air Force, which was sent to Ukraine for overhauling in August 2020, arrived in Sri Lanka on Friday. The Secretary to the Ministry of Defence, General Kamal Gunaratna, on the invitation of the Commander of the Air Force, Air Marshal Sudarshana Patirana, was present at SLF base in Katunaika to welcome the three Antonov 32s and their crew on arrival after a five-day journey from Ukraine to Sri Lanka. These aircraft, which were inducted to the Sri Lanka Air Force in the year 1995, are the largest operational heavy transport aircraft at the moment. These aircraft played a vital role during the 30-year-long war by transporting military personnel, civilians, wounded personnel, essential goods and munitions to and from the northern and eastern battlefronts. The operational aircraft had not been contributing to the air power requirements of the Air Force since November 2014, leaving the SLF the choice of using transport helicopters to cater for those requirements. However, with the return of these three aircrafts, the transport capabilities of the SLF will increase by 75%. These aircrafts were on ground for over seven years. We are going to use these aircraft after modification for maritime surveillance and reconnaissance to safeguard our EEZ of Sri Lanka, where we believe most of our assets are lying in the maritime domain. And also we are uh, using these aircraft for regional connectivity in case if there's uh, HADR or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief type of requirements where we need regional support, we can say in these aircraft overseas to bring those items for the betterment of safeguarding our Sri Lankan population and their assets. We used nearly about 7.5 million US dollars for upgrade and overhaul of these three aircrafts. We have the capacity to overhaul these aircraft up to level 1 and level 2 but after seven years on ground it's important that we do a level 3 and depot type of maintenance of these aircrafts which we don't have the capability so it's important that we find manufacturer of these type of aircrafts to send these aircraft there and do the overhaul. Now then, the first of a planned 35 organic fertilizer production facilities that are set to be set up across the island was inaugurated today. Under a project of the Ministries of Lands and Agriculture in partnership with the Mahavali Authority and Epaula Phosphate, the 700 million rupee program will be implemented at the district secretariat level. 
The recent decision by the government to ban the import of chemical fertilizers and pesticides has raised serious concerns throughout the farming community in the island. Chief among their concerns are whether the switch will have any effect on their yields and whether the country will be able to guarantee sufficient supplies of organic fertilizer to them. In this backdrop, a new program was launched to promote the production of organic fertilizer at the divisional secretariat level. Partnering up in the program are the Ministry of Lands, the Ministry of Agriculture, Epavala Phosphate and the Mahavili Authority. Through the program, 35 fertilizer production facilities are to be set up, while opportunities will be provided for 300 entrepreneurs in its first phase that will cover the entire island. With that, Minister of Lands SM Chandrasena inaugurated the first fertilizer factory, which commenced operations today. The 35 factories are to be set up with a 700 million rupee investment. The facility is set to produce organic fertilizer using a combination of raw materials such as water hyacinth, straw, cattle manure, Glyricidia leaves and stems, ipil ipil leaves, mana grass, and dried palmyra palm leaves. The factories will then produce the organic fertilizer with the addition of phosphates and will be set to begin supplying farmers in time for the next harvest season. We will see you on the other side of this break. Bear with us. Melibante, get the Padamate. Welcome back. You're watching First at Night. Now, analysts expect some volatility in the market in the week ahead, stemming from the fuel price hike that may raise costs for some companies. However, the fuel price increase may send interest in renewable energy companies up as a result. Now, here's Dimantha Matthew to take you through the market forecast for the week. Looking at the upcoming week, we feel that the market is uh, likely to be a bit volatile. So we have the fuel hike also coming in in the upcoming week. And also with that, we are not sure as to how the investors will take it because some of the companies will have an escalation in cost while some of the other companies will most likely benefit out of it, uh, especially the renewable energy companies. They are more demand for higher number of projects for these companies so overall what we feel is that the material sector it is a bit of a negative news so there is likely to be somewhat of a dip in uh, those uh, selected shares However, uh, we feel that investor interest could shift to more banking and diversified financial shares and also insurance and export-oriented shares uh, compared to the other companies that are having an impact. The World Bank has approved a 40 million US dollars in additional financing for Sri Lanka to expand water supply, sanitation and hygiene services in seven districts through the Water Supply and Sanitation Improvement Project. The project is expected to increase septage facilities in the more populated western, southern and northwestern provinces. The project finances new water supply systems, rehabilitation of existing water supply systems, toilets for households and schools and septage treatment plants. The World Bank Country Director for Sri Lanka, Faris Zervo, says that building on the good results of the parent project, the additional finance will extend coverage to areas of the country that are most vulnerable to climate-related risks and have the highest level of poverty. The $40 million loan is provided by the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The variable spread loan has a final maturity of 18 years, including a grace period of five years. We will see you shortly. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is First at Nine. Now, China has hit back at the G7, saying that the days when global decisions were dictated by a small group of countries are long gone. The heads of seven of the world's largest economies are meeting in Cornwall in England with countering China's sharp rise on the economic and military fronts over the last several decades on the agenda. A Chinese embassy spokesperson in the UK was asked to respond to the United States seizing this opportunity in the hope of bonding with Western countries and safeguarding the so-called rules-based international system. 
The spokesperson added that there is only one system and one order in the world, that is, the international system with the United Nations at the core and the international order based on international law, not the so-called system and order advocated by a handful of countries. Further, there is only one set of rules for the world, that is, the basic norms of international relations based on the purposes and principles of the UN Charter, not the so-called rules formulated by a small number of countries. The spokesperson added that there is only one kind of multilateralism, that is, the genuine multilateralism based on the purposes and principles of the UN Charter and international law and featuring equal treatment, cooperation and mutual benefits, not pseudo-multilateralism, serving the interest of a small clique or political bloc. The comments also come at the heels of the G7 leaders adopting a plan to rival China in building infrastructure in lower and middle income countries. Former Sri Lankan cricket captain Kumar Sangakkara has been inducted into the International Cricket Council's Hall of Fame. He is inducted under the modern era from 1996 to 2015 as a player who has made a great contribution to the game. He is the second Sri Lankan to be inducted behind spin bowling legend Muttaya Murlidharan on the 8th of June in 2017. And that's it from all of us here at First at Night. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.